Uh, so, welcome to the welcome to the uh, learning of Schubert's great D nine five eight, the C minor sonata. So, uh, first of all, <clears throat> a word or two about the sonata. A lot of people have likened uh, the beginning to Beethoven's variations, his uh, heroic variation. No, his his uh, his um, Beethoven's variations. Um, from uh, one of one of the sets of variations, and I can't remember the, the number. I can't remember, but it's but it begins in C minor, and it does begin like that. Yeah, so it begins the same way that the uh, Schubert's C minor sonata does begin the same way. But <clears throat> why would people think that that is the um, reason that that's the sort of influence on Schubert and not Schubert and not Beethoven's um, pathetic sonata, which also begins with a big C minor chord. Um, that's always baffled me. To, to do what I so um, I think I think that it's um, and especially if you read the really interesting book by John M. Gingrich called Schubert's Beethoven Project. Um, he doesn't talk about this. But he does talk about how Schubert wanted to start doing a, like a, a Beethoven project, basically, uh, as of 1824. And, of course, this sonata was written in 1828. But so I, would, I would kind of um, disagree with John M. Gingrich, as I do about, actually, his understanding of how Schubert did the E flat major trio, he thinks that he um, shortened it in order to uh, pander to the whims of the publishing house, which would have not wanted such a big final movement of the E flat major piano trio number two, which is um, also in 1828. I don't agree with that, um, but then I'm not a string player. I'm not really even a piano player, but um, John M. Gingrich is a, a cello player, so he probably knows uh, what he's talking about there. Um, uh, so anyway, um, the point is that um, I think, yeah, that if Beethoven, if Schubert did have a kind of Beethoven project, I, the Beethoven project being to copy Beethoven's works, basically, but do them bigger and better. Um, so, you know, so all the sonatas are at least as long as the hammer clavier. And he, all of his chord, all his symphony is, as, is, is at least as long as Beethoven's symphonies and longer. <clears throat> and um, his quartets are, are at least as long as Beethoven's quartets. They're all longer than Beethoven's um, quartets. All longer than Beethoven's symphonies and his piano sonatas are all longer than uh, his than Beethoven's piano sonatas, even the Hammer Clavier. Um, so that so I would agree that Schubert was trying to do a um, to to sort of uh, outdo Schubert uh, Beethoven. But whereas John M. Gingrich, in his very interesting book, thinks that that all began in eighteen twenty four, I think it began in eighteen twenty eight. After Schubert, after Beethoven's death, um, uh, so that, that's why I think that he was kind of coming in to he was beginning the, the sonata, his sonatas in in Schubert's Beethoven project. With he starts with the D nine five eight, the C minor, in order to sort of copy Beethoven's and outdo Beethoven's pathetic sonata which was a very famous sonata, even in Beethoven's time. Um, and so therefore Schubert's time. And so Schubert, I, I agree with John M. Gingrich that Schubert was very aware of the public and he was very aware of what would be most appealing. 
to the public, etc. I even agree a lot with uh, with what Beta, uh, John M. Gingrich says about Chupanzi, the violinist, head of the Chupanzi Quartet. He said that he and he says that he he thinks that Chupanzi was not so interested in performing Schubert's quartets because um, he thinks that Chupanzi regarded him as everybody did as just a lead lead is it lead or lead lead. Leader, leader, yes, leader, just as a leader composer, a, a song composer. And um, and so he was reluctant to play works that were obviously still in the leader um, genre sort of thing, such as Death and the Maiden, Quartet, and um, the uh, the way that the A minor quartet, that's the D minor quartet, or the A minor quartet, the way that begins, in, which is, I think, the Rosamond Quartet, isn't it? Yeah, and so that Rosamond Quartet is like the Rosamond Overture, which he had done. And that, again, was, um, I believe, a song, I think. Well, maybe not, but anyway, it was. Um, it begins, that quartet, the Rosamond Quartet, begins like a song, like, like a, um, like a, yeah, like a song, like Gretchen and... and um, Spinard, that's a Gretchen at the Weaver's Wheel. It begins the same way. And I don't think, I think that John M. Gingrich is saying that Chopinzig was a bit wary of this composer Schubert for quartets because he was really just a leader composer. And, um, but Schubert's plan was to show people that he was not only a leader composer, he was also a very serious quartet composer, but I think people understood that. <clears throat> That's why his works was, were performed so seldom, even by Chopinzi in his famous subscription series of quartets. So uh, John M. Gingrich talks all about that very well and persuasively, and I'd agree with that. However, I would not agree that he begins his Schubert project, his Beethoven project in 1824, which is what Gingrich says, Neither do I agree about his piano trio number two. That's another matter. So I think that Schubert's piano, uh, Schubert's Beethoven piano uh, project begins with this work because it's just like the Pathetic Sonata how it begins. Now I was looking for my edition of the uh, of these works, but I can't find them. Uh, I can't find them. Um, anyway, it's a it's a nice sonata. I think the best performance is by Richter, probably. Um, so he does a very good final movement of that sonata, which has a, which is very fast and um, and uh, it sounds. I think Andras Schiff, um, if I'm not mistaken, likens it to the gallop of a horse. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, because it's I think it's called a tarantella or something. Um, so it's a little bit like a, um, uh, I think that tarantella is something like a, it's a dance form, which is a kind of relentless uh, kind of dance, um, sort of, uh, okay, um, yeah, so I think it's a dance form. I think it's also linked to the spider, a tarantula, I think there must be some link to that. Anyway, get that, the final movement of the D9 58 is a bit like this uh, relentless, um, whirling, kind of slightly crazy mar um, dance or something like that. Anyway, Richter does a very fast and good version of it. I would not actually, um, I would not uh, recommend Alfred Brendel in, in any Schubert. Why? Because he shortens Schubert's works. He shortens the D960, the B flat major sonata, the great final sonata of Schubert in the first movement. Um, he doesn't play the fortissimo um, trills. And uh, he um, also shortens the D946, number one and number two. Not only does he not play the crossed out sections of the um, E minor, of the E minor, I think, E minor number one clavier stuck, D nine four six, but he also doesn't play um, for many of the, the 
bars of that first one as well. In the second clavier stroke, he um, misses a he, he also shortens the, the C section. And um, someone who shortens the shortens and, and misses out what Schubert wrote, I don't think that person could be considered a um, a good interpreter of Schubert. You know? Although I've got to say that it's Alfred Brendel's, I think, the recording of the D958 that got me first into classical music. And I uh, missed the CD of the three caveat stroke and the, I think, the three final sonatas, certainly the last sonata. Yeah, and the, uh, sorry, the 958, that's right, and the and the 959 and the 960. He did a CD of that, a double CD or something, with an of three caveat stroke as a bonus. So that was the, those are the CDs that got me first into classical music, I think. Or else it was uh, the first piano concerto of Tchaikovsky by Rubenstein, or it was the um, Spring Sonata of Beethoven, played by um, played by uh, is that going to, uh, chap who I've actually met. What's his name? Nigel Kennedy, yes, and also. Um, Yehudi Menuhin. Sorry, no, it's Yehudi Menuhin. Yeah, the recording I have is Yehudi Menuhin and um, Kemp. Yeah, that's what well, I know. <clears throat> so, anyway, um, I can't remember. But I think that it was the Schubert 958, which was the first piece of which got me into classical music around right about the age of 19 or 20. I was a late comer to piano. Um, and uh, so Tiffany Poon does a very good little excerpt of the D958 final movement. Um, so hopefully she can continue to hold of that sonata. Um, it is. It is. I, I began learning that sonata actually in the second movement. <coughs> it's not such a good second movement as the 959 or D960, but it's certainly quite nice. Um, it's not as. It doesn't have a, an ABA structure in the same. Perfect sort of way that the D959 and D960 does. <clears throat> um, but it's quite nice. It's really big chords from memory. It's got uh, many notes and things like that. But anyway, so, um, I, I used to love that start of D958. I loved the first movement. Um, anyway, uh, so this has turned out to be a talk about the D958 rather than uh, a um, performance of it. Not that I was able to um, play it well, but I was able to do, uh, as I said, first, the second movement I was beginning, uh, began doing. Uh, the D59, 959, I did do the whole of that second movement, not very well, but yeah, it's a difficult one to do the, to do the very um, uh, yeah, incredibly, what's the word, incredibly uh, dramatic, a central section of the second movement, but it's actually you know the notes are quite easy to uh, work out, even in that, in that sort of bit. And then the second movement of the D nine six zero, but that is also easy. But the central section is a bit challenging. I've, I've, I didn't end up doing that. I've, and now I've got I've got the time for it because um, I want to play pieces which are shorter and faster and. Um, and not, you know, not you know, so slow, basically. Even though it's absolutely beautiful, especially that D nine six O, the B flat major one. I think it's in C sharp minor in the middle section, part of it anyway. <clears throat> and C minor, I think. Um. Uh, so yeah, these three sonatas, I think, begin Schubert's Beethoven project, especially uh, rather with the, the first one, the one on D nine five eight. Um, it would be interesting to speculate on what the D959 kind of mirrors in terms of Beethoven sonatas and what the D960 mirrors. But what I will say is that it's interesting if we look at those three sonatas, we can compare them to Schubert's last string works because they're very similar. This D958 C minor one, ta -dum 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 -dum. this is very similar to, um, yeah, if you want to make a comparison between these quartets, it's very similar to the beginning of the Death of the Maiden quartet, really. Um, in a way, 
way it begins. So that's in D minor, this is in C minor. Um, and, and then the second, um, yeah, the second, uh, if we call it, the second string work, the second quartet would be the um, G, mi G major quartet. It's a, a, an amazing work, I should So amazing. That is very similar in a way to the way the, uh, the great D959 A major sonata begins, in a way. I mean, well, not, well, not really, because it does begin in a very major way. And then it comes minor and bleak in the same way that the um, G major quartet is absolutely bleak. <laughs> and I think it begins in a major way. Well, yeah, it does. The G major, I think, begins in a, with a major um, bow, uh, whatever it's called. And then it becomes minor. It goes from G major, starts in G major, and changes straight away into a minor. So that's very similar to the way the D959 begins in major and so quickly becomes minor. So that, I hadn't thought of that before, but that would be the link between that quartet and this D9, D959 sonata. And then the final of the three sonatas, the D960 B-flat major sonata, is very similar, I think, to um, the quintet. The, my favorite of all music, of all classical music, and that quintet. Absolutely beautiful. The way that is, begins, it's so serene. I think it's, it might say it, it might be like the D9, it might be, um, like the, you think it might be like the G major quartet and become tragic, but it doesn't, it continues to be, um, it becomes serene anyway. It's uh, just like the D960 B flat major sonata. They're very similar in that respect. They're also, in the way that it opens and it becomes serene and, and idyllic and quiet, more or less quiet. And it's very similar in the next movement or two. In the um, uh, yeah, the third, we've got an incredible third movement of the of that quintet. Um, that incredible third movement is very similar to the. Um, well, that's similar to the D nine five nine second movement. I would say yeah, but that's okay. So that's. Um, that's the exception that proves the rule, <laughs> to quote John M. Gingrich about something else. It's very good. But that, that would be the, my exception that quotes the rule. That does sound like actually D959, but you could say that, that, that for example, the, um, uh, the second movement of the great quintet, the way that begins, anyway, sounds just like the D960 um, second movement. Um, very sparse, totally ethereal, and um, um, uh, stratospheric, to use that word. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they certainly bear great resemblances. Um, and uh, yeah, but that quintet. Third movement is my favorite of all music. Not the you know, the central section of that third movement of the quintet. And um, it uh, bears great resemblances to, especially as I say, the D959 second movement. But also, in a way, to part of the, um, to part of the, uh, Yeah, of the D960, and I'll tell you which part, the first movement with that, with those fortissimo, um, with that fortissimo a trill, for example, is totally out of the blue and shocking in the same way that the, um, that's the first movement of the last piano sonata. I wish Brendel, by the way, does not play it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Even though Schubert wrote it, Misses that out. And you can also miss out the next bar, which connects it to the music. So you can miss out two 
uh, measures. Unbelievably. Anyway, um, uh, and why did work that happen? That's uh, no reason for it. I can understand why not playing the the E minor clavier strip number one, the bits that you crossed out. Obviously, I can understand that, even though they're beautiful uh, notes and they should be played. But not the um, not missing out the, the fortissimo trill in the first movement of the D nine six. Anyway, <clears throat> but that fortissimo trill, that sudden eruption, that volcanic eruption of the totally unexpected. You could link that to the quintet and the um, the third movement, the eruption of the unexpected. Uh, of course, um, the second movement of the quintet also has an eruption of the volcanic, of course, as well. So, excuse me, yeah, sorry, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, the eruption of the volcanic. Is, um, yeah, the, the eruption of the volcanic, excuse me, is in the second movement of the quintet, not the third movement. Yeah, the third movement is my favorite, but that's not because of the volcanic eruption, that's because of the incredible depths which, which Schubert plums in that third movement of the, of the uh, quintet. Okay, so but you could link the second movement, the central section of it, the eruption of the volcanic <coughs> temper of, of, uh, the, of, uh, of Schubert, some people have said. Uh, I think that's the case, but it, you could say that someone's volcanic temper um, erupting suddenly. Um, that you could link to the um, to the uh, yeah the fortissimo trill in the first movement of the D nine six O. That's what I wanted to to find here, but I have can't find the book. So we go have it. anyway, that's my talk finished. I think. Uh, it's been interesting.